Do you want it all or do you want me to abbreviate it? <laughs> Just be done by 12. Uh, I'm going to tell you right now, we're going to go past 12 if I give it to you all. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, I'm just going to warn you up front. Some of you may not like some of the things I have to say. Um, as the pastor and shepherd of this body, I feel compelled to talk to you about current events and try to bring perspective. I believe that we are witnessing the events leading up to the return of Jesus. Galatians 5.1 says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. I believe that there are powers at work to bring bondage to bring the church under subjection, to bring the people of this country under subjection. <clears throat> there is a deception taking place, and there are ravenous wolves that are seeking to destroy the sheep of God. There's an old saying that says, where there's smoke, there's fire. there's fire. And what does that mean? When there's enough smoke, when there's enough stuff going on, there has to be some truth. There has to be, smoke is just the evidence of something that's going on. Well, there is enough smoke in our nation that lends some credence to some of the things that are being said about what's going on. Now, I'm going to give you my perspective. You may agree with it. You may disagree with it. That's okay. But we all know from Revelation, there are certain events that have to take place before the Lord returns. It talks about in Revelation a one world government, a globalist, a global economy. It talks about a one person leader, the Antichrist leading it. We're not there yet. But as we look at the nation and as we look at some of the events, and I'll go through them, and I don't, I don't, this, uh, this is going to be my perspective. I could give you evidence, but I didn't want this message to be three hours long. <clears throat> I didn't want to talk for three hours. <laughs> that in order for there to be just this one element, if in order for there to be a one world government, America will have to lose its liberties. Because we wouldn't go along with it. And what do you see happening in our world right now, in our nation? I believe that there was an agenda started 12 years ago, and maybe even longer than that, but it became more overt starting 12 years ago. There are two things that are at play that I want to draw your attention to. One is the nation of Israel, and number two is the church. Under the previous presidency, not the current one, but the previous one for eight years, there had been a continual undermining of the nation of Israel. Billions of dollars were given to Iran. Nuclear technology was given to Iran to help them fortify. There is an agenda in play to Take out the church. Why does every dictatorship, the first thing they come after is religion? Because religion is the one thing that says, we're not accountable to you. We're accountable to a higher power. Yes. And we're not listening to you. 
So what's the first thing they do? Is they try to come after religion. I'm trying to do this as organized as possible because there's a rush of stuff I just want to throw up out, you know. But you see a systematic approach of undermining the church, of, of, of coming after religious liberty, and Israel. A huge monkey wrench was thrown into the plans in 2016. Everybody, the, the succession was that Hillary Clinton was to become president and further the agenda of what had been started. Trump was elected and threw it all into chaos. For four years, he has restored Israel, he has restored the religious liberty, he has appointed justices that will support our Constitution and our amendments to make America great again. There has been a relentless attack by the media, by big tech companies, to undermine his presidency and what's going on. I, again, where there's smoke, there's fire. I do not believe, I believe that there was fraud in this election. Now, it's really hard to know how much fraud. But we have to ask ourselves, why? We have the best economy. Our nation was doing great. Our, our reputation around the world was growing stronger because it had been undermined in previous administrations. Why is there such an attack? One, let me say, I don't believe the Republicans are the answer. I don't believe the Democrats are, are the devil. I believe one is more influenced by the devil, and I'll let you pick which one. <clears throat> but if you look at the agendas, if you look at what's going on, we, as the church, we have to look at and say, what's happening? What is going on? Why is this happening? Why is God allowing this? There has been an undermining of this election to to undermine this current president and get in. Now, again, I believe that Jesus Christ reigns supreme, that no matter what happens, our allegiance is to him. God will get us through whatever happens. But I believe more than, I, be, I strongly believe that this is a season for the church to wake up. That we cannot be silent anymore. Last week, if you were here, Isaac Riley gave a message. <clears throat> I want to bring out two points that he talked about. He said, number one, this COVID is a con. Okay, the COVID disease is a con. Now, as a pastor, I want clarity. COVID is real. It is a real disease. It's infecting and affecting many people, and it has caused death. How it is being used is a con. If you are over the age of 70, you are at a substantially higher risk for the disease, for the effects of the disease, and possibly even death. If you are under the age of 60, you have a greater likelihood of dying from other things other than COVID. 60, 70, <laughs> take your chance. <laughs> now, take precautions. You wear masks. Do whatever you feel comfortable, whatever you need to do to feel comfortable to go about. But... This is a test run to control people, to see what they can get away with in getting us to obey in shutting down and in 
Do you remember the game Simon Says? Simon Says, hop on one foot. Hop on one foot. Oh, you did it, you're out. You have to do what Simon Says. They are playing Simon Says in our nation. Okay, everybody, Simon Says, wear a mask. Simon Says, stay in your houses. Now, they're using fear to control. Okay? They use this as an opportunity to, to mess with the election. We are in strange times. Looking forward, I'll be honest with you, I was pretty confident that we were going to have four more years. For three days after the election, and I'll get to that. <laughs> For three days afterwards, I was, God, what, what, what are you doing? This is not how this is supposed to go. Are you, what, are you aware of what's happening? And I was physically sick. It, it was like, oh. because this, is, and for this reason, if this really is going the way it's, it looks like it's going to go, America, we are, we are drawing closer to his return. Okay. Oh, yeah. Because they will put things in place to bring his return. Yeah. We're, we're, the, we're closer. I thought possibly we would get a four year. Now, there's still a lot of hope that somehow this is going to be overturned and, 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 and I'm hoping too. I'm praying. God is never late. He's always on time. He's never late. But we have to be realistic in the way it's going right now. It looks like there's going to be a new president. Oh. Yeah, all those people that promised to leave when Trump got elected, they're going to come back, right? <laughs> okay, if it, if it moves, this is the danger. And again, I'm not trying to throw, uh, look, the Democrats of today are not the Democrats of 40 years ago. It's a completely different party. If it goes the way and you see the people he's appointing into positions of power, they're coming after our religious liberties, the Second Amendment. There's a, 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 a civil war that's about to brew because good luck with them coming after our guns. There's going to be a fight. There's going to be a battle. Okay? You look at the agenda of the Democratic Party, they support, they are going to elevate and get behind every LGBTQRSTUVWXYZ. <laughs> What is the one thing that stands in the way of that lifestyle? Church. It's the Bible. Yeah. So they are going to make it, and, and, and Mr. Biden has already, as a vice president, done everything he can to say that you are, I don't know what the word is, that if you are against that, those lifestyles, we're going to put you down. They're going to support in every way possible the alternative lifestyles. Now look, let me be clear. God gave us all free will. We have the right to do and to choose how we want to live, what we want to do, and, and suffer the consequences of behaviors that go against the Word of God. If that's what they want to do, Fine. In fact, the Bible tells me I still have to love them. I still have to, to be nice to them. Just because they're choosing to live a different way. That, that I'm not to judge them. I'm still to try to win them to Christ. It's when it's forced upon us. When it's, shant, it's crammed down our throats that we have to, we can't talk against it. You know, there's, there's so many laws already on the books about 
conversion therapy. Psychologists, psychiatrists cannot, you cannot take your child, if they're struggling with gender dysphoria, you cannot take them to a psychologist to help them walk through it. They would lose their license trying to help somebody get clarity. And that's the way this is going to go. So we see this march towards everything that's anti-God. God has no choice but to withdraw his blessing on America and let judgment come, just as he did the children of Israel. This is no time to be playing games with God. It is time to get serious. The church is still the answer, and Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is the answer, and his vehicle for getting his message across is the church. It's time to wake up. Now, having said all that, if by some chance the election is overturned and there's a reprieve, it, it doesn't mean that they're going to stop. Because there is an agenda that is marching us towards the end time events. And never before in my life, I know my parents used to, especially my mom, would instill in us a fear that Jesus could come back at any moment. <laughs> because that's how they were raised. We kind of looked at it and said, eh, not so much. <laughs> and, and there may be some here today going, you know, do you really know it could be like still 50 years? It could be. It could be. But never before have you seen events and world events and nations, things lining up that fit the, the biblical narrative. And that's where we have to take notice. And that's what we have to be aware of. Now, God could have other plans. Again, going back to the word from last week, God is so much bigger than what we're focused on. Do you, do you realize right now that COVID and the presidential election are not the highest things on God's agenda? Think about that. It is for us. And that's not to say that God doesn't care. Because it affects us and we care that he cares. But God is not up there wringing their hands going, what's going to happen with this, this election? Or this COVID, it's really bad. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows how this is all going to play out. It's not high on his priority list. Now, again, that's not to say that God's not moving and that God won't bring healing and God's not in it and with us through this all. But this is where we get tunnel vision and we can be going, okay, if Trump doesn't get it, what's going to happen? You know what? God's still going to be in control. Amen. If God allows Mr. Biden and Kamala Harris, <laughs> Whatever. It's not my president. No. If they if they become in charge, God is so much bigger than those events. He's so much bigger than the COVID. And we can get tunnel vision. We can get so locked in to Trump has to win. Trump has to win. He has to get it has to be overturned. That if it doesn't happen. We can miss what God is doing because we were so fixated on an answer. And we have to realize that God is so much bigger than those events. And this isn't real high on his priority list. So the question is, what is high on his priority list? Because when, when we get in tune with him and we're listening to him and hearing his heart, COVID isn't a big deal. The presidential election isn't a big deal. What's happening in our lives isn't a big deal because when we're in tune with what God is doing, what God is saying, 
that's where God's working. And where God's working, there's his grace and his presence and his power. And it makes all this other stuff seem so inconsequential. So real quickly, I want to give you three areas. And, and, and again, before I do, I, I just want to reiterate. Whatever's going to happen, however this is going to play out, Jesus is the answer. Amen. And Jesus is looking to us to be the light of the world. That no matter what happens, the church is where he's going to be working. And not to fear, not to allow fear to dictate our responses. Now, real quickly, I want to try to give you three areas where I believe, uh, wait a minute, there was one more. I'm kind of away from my notes, so. Yeah, we noticed. Okay, Galatians 5, 16 and 17 says this. I say then, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the, for the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. Okay, there's a struggle going on within us. There's a battle that's going on within us. And all of it's, all the stuff that's happening around us is either feeding the flesh and causing fear and anxiety and worry or feeding, the, feeding our spirits, which causes confidence and faith and boldness, okay? Jesus, one of his concerns is he's looking for his church to be a people that will walk according to his spirit and not according to our flesh, not according to the desires of our heart. In other words, again, we're getting back to that place of, God, what are you doing? What are you saying? God, it doesn't matter. I'm not looking to the Republicans. I'm not looking to the Democrats. I'm looking to you. God, what are you saying to me in this season, in this hour? What are you asking me to do? God, help me to be in tune with your spirit as I walk through life, as I walk through these circumstances. And, and, and listen, listen, Life isn't going back to normal. Life isn't going back to just hanging out, go to dinner when you want, go to the movies. Look, sports and entertainment aren't going to do it anymore. Life is changing. Our world is changing. We have got to be, this is a time where his church, believers, you and I, have to get in tune with God. Because if we're going to survive as we march towards the return of Jesus, it's going to take people that are obedient and listening to the Holy Spirit. I believe in these last days... That before he comes physically, there is going to be an increase of the manifestation of Jesus in the world. Which means there's going to be an increase of signs and wonders and miracles. Of healings and of deliverance. That some of what we experienced this morning is just a little taste of what God is going to do as his presence. The title of my message, which I even forgot to get, People Get Ready. Jesus is coming. And when I mean Jesus is coming, both he, there's a physical return he's coming, but there is a, a coming of his presence that is going to ratchet it up. And look, we can't, we shouldn't get used to, and I'm not prophesying, this isn't a thus saith the Lord, this is my observation, but these shortages that we're seeing, you know, stock up on toilet paper. <laughs> Why in the world of all the things that are are, that's the one that we, anyway, I, I don't get it, but, <clears throat> but listen, shortages are going to become common. And I'm, I'm going I'm to tell you something that might blow your hair, but Jesus provided, God provided for the children of Israel manna in the desert. I believe that in the last days there may come a time when God is providing manna for his children. Just as supernaturally as he did. 
we've got to be in tune. If God says, go out into your backyard and scoop up the dew, we can, why would we do that? That just seems stupid. That we need to be in tune with His Spirit. We need to be walking by the Spirit and learning to walk, live by the Spirit and be attentive and in tune to what God is saying because He's going to cause us to help us to avoid trouble, lead us out, and provide for us supernaturally. So we've got to learn how to walk by the Spirit. Three things I want to draw your attention to that I think is going to increase in these next three that are higher up on God's priority list that may begin to be manifested more in our, in our world. Okay? First one is, God is purifying His bride. God is more interested in, in purifying His bride as it gets closer to the return of Jesus than the presidential election or COVID or some of the other things were. Now, again, don't misunderstand me. God cares about your needs. He cares about where you live. He cares about what's on your heart. But where we're zeroing in and focusing on might not be as high a priority as what God. And I think these are higher priorities. Okay, Galatians, no, uh, the next one. Ephesians 5, 20, it, Ephesians 5, 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Now listen. That he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. That he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that, the, that they should be holy and without blemish. God is going to present to his son a bride, we are the bride of Christ, that is without spot or blemish. That there is an awful lot, the body of Christ today is anemic and powerless and underdressed. Amen. And it is time that we put away our sin and our compromise and allow the Holy Spirit to begin to convict us. And I believe as days go on, even as we move into 2021, that the conviction of God is going to begin to ratchet up. It's going to be more evident and more prevalent. For a lot of us, we're not even sure what the conviction of God feels like. That it's been so long since we felt that, don't do it, that we felt that, oh man, I just really messed up. That it's going to be a foreign feeling to many of us. What will this look like? There will be an uneasiness in situation that previously was not there. All of a sudden, you're going to be in situations and doing things that all of a sudden you're going to feel... Something's not right. Something's going on here. And you're going to go, this is so weird. Why, I, I, it's, everything looks normal. Everything looks fine. Why am I feeling like this? The things will begin to leave you feeling icky or slimed. As things, are, things that were once considered evil as, it be, as, it, as it's being called good and things that were good are now being called evil, there is a higher prevalence of demonic activity that you're going to walk into rooms, you're going to walk into places, or you may just be walking in Walmart, and all of a sudden you just feel, ooh, what was that? I just seen the ad on the on e dot make a or whatever. No. And it's it's everywhere. Horrifying. That I've had people call me and say, "Man, I was just in Walmart, and I, I just, I feel like the enemy slimed me. That I just feel icky. I just feel ugh. okay." As, as God purifies his bride, as, as we walk in more conviction, as we walk, the, those things are going to happen more and more, where God is wanting to clean us up, where it says, talks about washing of the water by the word, that we get into the word, and the word of God begins to convict us, it begins to cleanse us, it begins to point out and say, you know what, 
has compromise there. That his conviction will begin to convict us of sin. That programs, habits, patterns, attitudes, and places of compromise and words spoken that previously didn't bother you will begin to bring a heaviness and a conviction of wrong. That all of a sudden, you know, you used to, man, you could throw zingers around, you could just cut people down, you could just say things, you could give attitude and, and go on your merry way and just think nothing was wrong. And now all of a sudden it's like God's going, go back and apologize. <laughs> For what? For what you just said. What I say? That's the conversation we have in our head. What you just said was rude back there. Oh, come on, no, I was just kidding, they know that. Don't ignore those. That's the Holy Spirit bringing conviction. That's the Holy Spirit beginning to say, look, it's time to clean up our act. God is coming for a bride that is without spot or without blemish that is worthy of his love. And we, again, we've gotten so comfortable and have compromised so much, we don't even recognize sin anymore. What God would call sin, we, uh, we have our list. We have the high stuff up there that, you know, you, you stay away from those. But being mean or being unloving or being unkind by a, a coarse joke, an off-color joke, an innuendo, well, I didn't know I was just kidding. It's not about kidding anymore. It's about getting cleaned up. And God is going to start working on his bride to clean us up. The fear of the Lord will increase, which means you don't want to make him mad. You know, you all knew what to do to make your dad mad. You knew which buttons to push. Yeah, get on, yeah. Be mean to mom. Be rude to mom. Then dad got involved. But there, all of a sudden, there's just going to be a, a greater fear. Of, man, I don't, I don't, I don't want to upset the Lord. I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to displease the Lord. It's not that we're going to get spanked. It's just that we, we want to, st we're being motivated. And, and all of a sudden, you're going, why am I even feeling this? Where is this coming from? It's because God's going to begin, is working to clean up his church. The voice of the Holy Spirit will be louder and will be trying to stop these behaviors. You're going to hear more and more, don't do that. Don't say that. Don't go there. Stop it. And it'll be real easy to brush it off. It'll be real easy just to ignore it. But pay attention that in these last days as we begin to move forward, why? Because God is beginning to prepare his bride for his return. The second concern that I think God has is there's a concern for those that do not know the Lord. 1 Peter 3 says this, in knowing this, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. So there's going to be people going, oh man, we've been talking about Jesus coming back for a thousand years. It still hasn't happened. And there's going to be scoffers. There's going to be those that are going, you know, well, we got plenty of time. Don't worry about it. Just keep going. I mean, it's, it's been what? Since creation. How long has that been? 6,000 years? He still hasn't returned. But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord, one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as one counts slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Why is God delaying? Why is he taking his time? Is because he is not willing that any should perish. God's heart is for all of your unsaved family, loved ones, friends, neighbors, the world. God is wanting as many to come. And guess who he's going to use to reach them? Us. In the last days, God wants all people to come to a knowledge of his saving grace. Okay? Let me just give you a little, little brush up on the gospel. Brush up on the good news of Jesus Christ. Brush up on how to get, lead someone in salvation. Because God, the opportunities are going to begin to increase. What does this look like? There's going to be a boldness in declaring the message of Christ. 
it will be stronger in you. All of a sudden, you're going to have, where you would be timid, where you used to be weak, where you used to think, oh, I can't say anything. All of a sudden, there's going to be like, you, the words are going to be right there, and you're going to be going, Pah! and you're going, oh, why did I do that? Because all of a sudden, there's going to be more of a boldness. There's going to be more of a confidence. Because God is not willing that any should perish. There's going to be a deep concern for your immediate family. All of a sudden, you're going to start looking around, and parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, all of a sudden, there's going to be, not that you're not concerned now, but all of a sudden, there's going to begin to be more of an urgency. I believe one of the greatest tragedies and the thing that it causes me to pray more than anything is for me to be in heaven without my children, without my grandchildren. That I want to make sure they're all there with me. As time gets closer, there's going to be more and more of a burden that God puts on us to make sure our family goes with us. That they at least have had an opportunity to accept or reject the message of Jesus. And there's, again, more and more of a boldness to begin, what can I do? How can I reach them? God, now, look, one thing I've learned over this last year or a message that God has tried to instill in me over this last year is, apart from him, we can do nothing. This is going to be, God, show me how to witness to my children. Show me how to proclaim the message to my grandchildren. Help me to know what to say, how to do it. God, I need your help here. I cannot do this on my own. There's going to be a growing, uh, there's going to be a heaviness or burden for the lost. A growing awareness of the Holy Spirit in your prompting, prompting you to do things you would not normally do. All of a sudden, you're going to feel his finger in your back going, do this, say this, get involved, become a Sunday school teacher, start something in your neighborhood. And we're going to go, uh, I don't want to do that. But there's going to be a, a, a heaviness, a push to get more involved, to proclaim the message, to reach more people. There's going to be more of a love for people that wasn't previously there. All of a sudden, there's going to be more of a love of, uh, I want to take as many people as I can. And you're going to go, why am I even feeling this? This is not so not me. You know, I'm glad I'm going to heaven, but if they, if they don't want to go, that's up to them. That's fine. But all of a sudden, there's going to be more of a love for just people, and, and that's God doing something. And again, the key to all of this is not just dismissing it. Jesus is coming soon. Now, soon may be 30 years. I don't know. But we're in the seconds, not the minutes. Let me just tell you the story real quick. Back in 1980-something, I can't remember the specific thing, I was at a pastor's conference. And the pastor got up, it was Pastor Jack Hayford, got up uh, and was speaking to the, this congregation of pastors. And he said, you know, I had this vision, I had this picture the other day. And he said, I never thought about this. But he said, you know, in order for Jesus to return, he has to stand up, he has to get up from his throne. It says he's seated at the right hand. And he had a picture of Jesus beginning to rise up. Now, this was back in 1980, that he was beginning to rise up out of his chair to come back. Okay, it's taken him 30 years to stand up. So how much longer is it going to take him to step off and come back? I don't know. But we see events lining up. We see these things beginning to happen. God's heart is for his church. They be without spot or blemish. God's heart is for the lost. That people, would, they would come to repentance. And he's going to use his church. He's going to use us. And we can't dismiss the promptings, the leadings, the convictions that come with the Holy Spirit. Lastly, and I'm trying to be fast. <clears throat> There's going to be a deep desire. There's going to be a desire will increase to seek God and know what is on his heart. There's going to be an increased desire to seek after God and to know what is on his heart. Jeremiah 29, 13, it says this, And you will seek me and find me when you search with me with all your heart. 
God wants to be found. God wants to show us and wants to tell us his plans and purposes for us. He wants us to be in intimate fellowship with him. And he says, if we will do the diligence to seek after him, we will find him. We will find him, we'll find his heart. James 4.8. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Get holy. Get cleaned up. And purify your hearts, you double-minded. In other words, get a singular vision of what you want. Double-minded is, ah, oh, I'm over here and I'm over here. I'm doing this. I want this. It's getting a singular vision of God. I want you. I want all that you have for me. I want you, I want to hear your voice. And then Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Okay, this is a dying to ourselves. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer Tom who lives. All my passions, all my desires, all my wants are being laid to rest. And God, what is it that you want? What are you saying to me? That, that this is going to increase. There's going to be more and more of a laying down of our agendas, of our plans, of our programs. And we're saying, Jesus, live through me. God, I want more of you. Look, in the last days, this is going to be the verse this is going to be the situation if we're going to survive those days that are coming. Look, if we're going to survive the days we're in right now, the difficulties and the hardships, God wants us to know him, and he wants us, he wants us to know what's on his heart. What is his priorities? What is his priorities for your life? What is he saying to you right now? The things that this world will hold less and less, have a less and less hold on us. That sports and entertainment will no longer be the escape or the bring the pleasure that it once did. A lot of the things that we used to run to, a lot of the things that we used to go do to, to, to feel better are no longer going to have its hold. They're no, it's no longer going to fill that place. It's only going to be filled by Jesus, by walking in that deep relationship with him. There's going to be an increase of loving family and people. As we draw closer to him, as we love him, his love is going to be poured out in us, in our families, and the people around us. Things will not satisfy like they used to. Last week, Ike, in his message, said, <clears throat> don't fall for the con. But he also said this, we have to know who we are. We have to know who we are as believers in Jesus Christ who our identity, who he's made us to be, that we are more than overcomers. We're his sons and daughters, that we walk in a power and an anointing that the world does not know, that the enemy is doing everything he can to silence you, to keep you in your seat, to keep you from your purpose, to keep you from your identity. And it is time for the church to rise. It is time for us to not just worry about what our occupation is, not worry about all the bills and all that. God will take care of all that. The highest priorities right now is, is your family saved? Are we walking in relationship with him? Are we hearing, are we attuned to his voice? Look, God puts a priority on character over talent. Integrity over just getting something done, over productivity that the fruits of the Spirit are more important than the gifts of the Spirit. That we've got to get in tune with God's priorities. We've got to know who we are. Lay down. This whole year has been about surrender. And you know what? Starting in March, we've had to surrender a lot of things. The second part of surrender is prayer. Of God, what are you doing? What are you saying? In this presidential election, in COVID, God, what are you doing? What are you saying to us? It's only in that relationship with him that we're going to be able to really navigate these days. There's no more time to play. There's no more time to compromise. 
it's time to get serious. Let's get about the Father's business. Let's stand. Well, Pastor, that was a real Christmas me 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 message there. Jesus came. Jesus came. He died on a cross. And he's coming back to be Lord of all. To be King of kings and Lord of lords. Let's be ready. Let's be ready. Let's be prepared. Father, I thank you. We thank you for the gift of Jesus. God, I thank you that this is a new day and a new season and a new time. And God, I pray as we march towards whatever events are coming up, God, I pray that we would be prepared and ready. Lord, I pray for this people. God, it's no accident that they're here this morning, that they've heard this message and the seriousness of this hour. God, I pray for the young people. God, the world that, they, that we once knew, they may never know. God, I pray for an increase of your presence in this place. Lord, I pray for every Sunday to be like today. God, where your presence is so strong and so real and hearts are being changed and touched. God, use us. God, help us to get in line with your priorities. God, I pray this morning that we would reaffirm in our in deep within us that, God, you are sovereign. You are Lord of all. That nothing catches you by surprise. God, that this election, this COVID, the things, the things we, we know you care, but God, there's so many, so much bigger going on around us. God, we want to be where you are. We want to be involved with what you're involved with. Help us to know your heart. God, help us to be in tune with what you're doing. God, I pray for this people. I pray your abundance of grace and mercy upon us. God, prepare us for the coming days. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.